Welcome to Black History Boot Camp. Oh, this is day 10 of a 21 day walking meditation. We are just about halfway through this journey together, and I have needed it. I have needed it. The world is topsy turvy. I have needed it. But you know, it's like, um, are you there, V? This is Morgan. Welcome to everyone. Are you there? Hey there. Oh, bless to everyone in their different weathers, knowing that you are you always have to identify with the blue sky and know that the weather is just passing, B. It's just passing. Um who's who said ain't I a woman? So John the Truth. So John the Truth said, listen. It's, uh, if all these men got the world turned upside down, surely these women together can turn it right side up. So I am feeling hopeful today. I am feeling good. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm feeling hopeful and good too. Thank you. I'm blessed. Happy as the weekend. <laughs> Happy as the weekend. Praise oh. the God that I've walked all these five days um, and just feeling good. I know. It has felt good to be back out in the streets, back feeling good, active. Um, listen, I think I done lost the weight in these two weeks. That's all I'm saying. I, I think my stomach is concave. I think it's a little bit concave. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. It might be a little bit concave. Listen, y'all, I want to get right into it. Today is going to be a beautiful conversation. I'm excited for it. I'm excited to learn. I'm excited to get your opinions and your thoughts, all of you especially you, my friend V, like, I just really want to have this conversation. I think it's overdue. Uh, we've been talking about um, tensions and moral complex, moral dilemmas around what is our philosophy on freedom fighting? Where do we stand? What is our blueprint for how we want to show up in the world? And we've, I mean, we've talked about everything about like, do we want to be responsible or do we want to be a little bit more ratchet? Do we want to have fist in the air or do we want to have a hand extended? Like these kind of dualities, do we want to really highly pursue education or entrepreneurship? You know, these, these kinds of um, what can be tensions and what we have learned is that yes and there is power. When you put yes and, yes, I want education and we don't stop there. We go toward entrepreneurship. Well, there's a, there's a very healthy conversation to be had today. And today's words or dichotomy is really between, do you want to be feminine or do you want to be a fighter? Do you want to be feminine or do you want to be a fighter? And, you know, I thought about not even using those words because, like, there's so much in gender politics. There's so much in, like, the idea of femininity and masculinity that feels, like, dated and old and dusty. Um, And I was like, maybe we do soft life or soldier. And I was like, nope. That's the easy way out because everybody wants a soft life. Nobody wants to be a soldier. That's the easy way out. But thinking about what it means to be feminine in the context by which you have to fight is a tension. It is a tension that I just personally want to talk about because given the unique history, particularly of African women around the world, and I would even say particularly, particularly of women who went through the transatlantic slave trade, where we worked in the field right next to our men, did the same kind of labor as our men. This is a conversation we should have. I just saw on the, on the internet, I don't know if you saw um, Vanessa Esther is doing this cool thing around, um, she's got funding and a big fellowship around masculinity and like no. exploring toxic masculinity. Oh, okay. From emotional justice, that Esther. Yeah. And I was so proud of her. Yeah. And we were talking about this a lot in our domestic violence episode around what does it really mean for men to stand up for women? And like, there's a whole, like, I think, surgence of, um, of conversations, particularly among and within four black men around, um, what some people are calling tonic masculinity, so the opposite of toxic masculinity, but like what is healing, what is tonic when he, when a man shows up in his manhood. But I haven't heard that much conversation around what's toxic femininity and what then would be tonic femininity. So I wanted to talk about it today. I was like, maybe we could start a new conversation here about it because black women have had to 
really sacrifice our own femininity. Sasha Femininity is an election result. Sasha Femininity was an election <laughs> result. Okay. Sasha Femininity was like, I, I know, I know y'all think you a woman, but we over here in the womanness of being protected, and therefore y'all could be out in the field. It's crazy. Like, no, we gotta have this conversation. That's brilliant. It is a brilliant assessment. I was um, doing some research. I wanted to better understand even what people meant when they meant toxic masculinity. And I think I knew, but I was like, what do you think about when you think about toxic masculinity, V? Ooh, I think about a hyper vigilance around um, aggression as being like the primary kind of like emotion and stance that you have to take. I think about like um, actually a lack of integration of your own feminine side because I think we all have both. So when I think about toxic masculinity, yeah. I think about men who are not actually tapped into their own feminine nature and their feminine side and that they are um, leading right. from a place of dominance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I never even thought about that, that a woman could have toxic masculinity, too. <laughs> it's like, that's crazy. Yeah, that's it true. Isn't, I know, isn't you're right. necessarily related to gender. Yeah. I looked it up, and they, and they had everything that you talked about, emotional suppression and, and, and representing that as aggression or anger, as you said, dominance and control, as you said. Sexual entitlement was something they said. Homophobia and misogyny. Rejection of asking for help. Um, work over family, risk-taking behavior. I mean, and what I'm thinking about, like so many people that I know, male or female, there's some of these things are really, I think, even relevant, right? Dismissing non-traditional, um, perpetuating rigid gender roles. Um, this is what like toxic masculinity is. And then I was just like, well, then what would we think toxic femininity is? Do you have any ideas there? Ooh, um, yeah, uh, batting your eyes and just looking like, how am I going to do this even when you know how to? Um, or, um, Ooh, that's using, good. <laughs> or even using um, sex or your um, physical attributes as a lead in to get what you want. And even, um, I think there's some toxic femininity that happens around like facilitating competition when competition doesn't need to be there, but you're facilitating it because that's how women have been taught to show up in the collective as in competition with each other. Vanessa, you really need to write a book. You're really smart. <laughs> <laughs> you write a book. It's so good. I mean, we, I mean, we, we got the list like down. right down. <laughs> you got it so good. An overemphasis on appearance submissiveness um, and deferring to men, weaponizing your vulnerability, talk about the election, reinforcing gender stereotypes, perpetuating gossip and rivalry, which you said, sacrificing personal goals, dependency, um, shaming nonconformity, reinforcing toxic masculinity, and martyrdom, really valuing mm -hmm. self-sacrifice as the ultimate expression of love. I was like, whoa, Vanessa. Oh. It is a conversation, and I want to talk about just the opposite of that because we sometimes highlight the negative. When we talk about what it means to be tonic or healthy femininity or tonic femininity, um, like a tonic water, right? So toxic is like poison, tonic is healing, right? So tonic femininity, we think about emotional intelligence, we think about authenticity, we think about collaboration. We think about deep empowerment, like self-confidence and advocating for equality. We think about resilience and like the ability to overcome a way maker. We think about nurturing and creativity and mentorship of coming back to get others when you learn. Kind of like on um, The Color Purple. <laughs> what are we, we going to teach each other here? That's and then right. we think about our men when they're very tonic or masculine energy, even in ourselves, is emotional awareness, empathy and compassion, healthy leadership, collaboration, respect for boundaries, accountability, um, strength and vulnerability, and balanced ambition. And I was just like, I love this conversation so much. And I love this conversation in the context of suffering and in the context of scarcity and in the context of violence. Because often culture and gender roles play a very helpful role. If you're walking down the street and somebody try to rob you, 
I mean, you might bat your eyes and see if that could work. But <laughs> saying like it is a tool. Right. It is a tool. Like this, this deep, 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 like um, adherence to status quo and roles. It is. It makes people feel comfortable. It creates order sometimes. So there is an actual like hello, good evening. There's an actual. Um, can I talk about no one of you? It's cute. <laughs> Like there's an actual role for it. So I wanted to um, talk about what it means to be a woman in the context of generational generational oppression and what it means to be feminine, feminine, no matter your gender, in the context feminine. Remember we talked about like vulnerability, we talked about balance, we talked about nurturing in the context of a of a situation where we were forced to use our bodies to feed other people's babies, where we were forced to procreate in ways that were violent, where we were forced to defer our voices and not speak up. And we could learn that the way not to be hurt or harmed is to be more masculine. And I would venture to say that across the world, we have leaned in that direction for safety and protection. And so I personally have been, and so, and there's a whole movement around, you know, reconnecting with your divine feminine, reconnecting with goddess energy, reconnecting um, with the flow of life, with vulnerability, with all of the things that make us soft. Boy, do I want that for us. I want that for us. And I started thinking about like, where did I learn about femininity? And like, who in my family demonstrated femininity versus masculinity? And I'm particularly talking about the Black women in my family who demonstrated femininity over masculinity. Um, and femininity was so discouraged question. in my household. Like, I promise you, it was so discouraged because every single woman in my household was vigilant. I'm talking about vigilant against sexual abuse, vigilant against sexual violence, vigilant against like even the specter that you might draw attention to yourself. There was like so much of that in my family um, and rightfully so, because there was so much, such, such patterns of abuse in my family that like my aunties, my grandma, like everybody, like the, the stance and the posture that we were taught was to be one of like hyper independent hyper you could do things on your own like hyper we got this like in this way that um i always felt like was hard because i i am i love mm -hmm. holistic as a mascara i love to do all sorts of, but like my family just really and it wasn't just about aesthetic it was like a demeanor where we were discouraged yeah from leaning into those aspects yeah. of ourselves it's almost like wearing masculinity is like a protection and a shield and particularly yeah. when, I mean, the women in your family are also gorgeous and like, so like particularly when you have a particular aesthetic or when you have had like a history of abuse or when you have, you know, like, how do you protect yourself? And I think black women at large have that issue. We find, yeah. right. <laughs> like we find across the world. And, and I'm just like, from awesome. I wanted to investigate black history around this. And so I wanted to share a story with you of someone who I think got it right, who was able to be a freedom fighter and whole and fierce in the ways that she needed to, and even flex her masculinity when she needed to, but really sat in the pocket of femininity in this way that was equally if not more powerful than this kind of quintessential freedom fighter posture and she changed the world and was impactful because of her divine femininity not in spite of it and i just imagine a world where all one million of us on the on the phone understand how to flex that part of our side as well right no matter what your sexual orientation is, no matter what your gender is, that you learn, particularly Black women, you learn how to be soft and vulnerable. You learn how to be nurturing and contemplative. You learn how to be collaborative. Um, 
I am trying to learn those things, Vanessa, I really am. And it has been so useful to see different models of it as I travel around the world. And so I'm grateful that today's Black History Bootcamp comes from the continent of Africa because I have learned so much from my time spent here. All right. I told you I don't even, I only wear dresses. <laughs> Look at people who know Morgan from back in the day, Tomboy Morgan. I only wear dresses. I be carrying stuff on my head. I be sauntering on my hips. I be back, I'm growing my eyelashes back out. Like, I'm just saying, I'm trying really hard to like feel what feels natural to me and what feels like pre-colonial and like put my feet in the ground and understand like when I am charged, when I am turned on, when I have something to say, when I want to be in a repose. And like, it has been a real healing journey. And so I'm grateful. I'm grateful that we're going to talk about the continent of Africa. We're not just going to talk about any woman in Africa. We're going to talk about a woman who is widely regarded and known as Mama Africa. Half the people just lit up on the phone because you know I'm talking about Miriam Makeba. Miriam Makeba is one of the most significant artists in the diaspora. She has passed on now, and we give reverence to Mama Africa and her family and all of the people whose lives she touched, particularly to the country of South Africa, where she was born and where she spent her life loving publicly and fighting fiercely and advocating for and loving deeply. So Miriam Makeba, Vanessa, do you know about Miriam Makeba? If so, what do you know about her? Um, what would you want us to explore? Do you have questions? Yeah, I just I know her music. Um, I know she was called Mama Africa, mm -hmm. and that's really all I all I genuinely know. So I'm looking forward to this episode, and I'm looking forward to it too because I want to draw one more line back to. I know everybody's tired about this election, but this matters. I was in the hairdresser yesterday, and they were playing the Breakfast Club. Like these people have infiltrated everywhere. And there's this very popular woman on there named Dr. Joy. I don't know if you've seen her across Instagram, but yes, like a, yes, okay. yes, yes. So this woman, she went, she had, she was talking about Kamala and she was saying, um, well, I did vote for her. She was like, but she was like the fact that she didn't come out. And we talked about this on our episode. She said the fact that she didn't come out to the Howard campus on the night of her defeat shows that she's a woman not in the control of her emotions. She said it shows that she's a, a woman who uh, didn't know how to bounce back and show up in the moment. She was like, it shows that, that they were right about her. And I was like, wait, what? It's like so, and we had just talked about this. And she was like, yeah, she wasn't, and she, she, she talked about it very, very eloquently and very, very compelling, but I felt really conflicted because I didn't agree with that. I thought like, no, I understood why she didn't show up in that moment. And we have, we are asking so much of people, but then I was just like, dang, like our emotions and how we hold our emotions in women, like people are looking and they're making such judgments. So I'm just thinking about also our emotions around femininity and just when and how people tell us where we're allowed to show up with our emotions, where we're not, how we have to control them how people gaslight us around them so i'm i'm excited about this conversation i know i feel like i need to take a deep breath after that like yeah. dang we yeah. can't be sad yeah 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 and she that woman gets criticized so much about how masculine she is um like you know all these yeah. it, this instagram culture of like these talkbacks and clapbacks crazy. and all this stuff and the, yeah it's just really crazy yeah. um i want so to even say this even when does the podcast become visual because i'm saying that's even a part of the clapback culture that we went from platforms where we were talking for the conversation to now we're even looking and so we brought it back to that in this way <laughs> that we better pay attention y'all it's all um it's just all that good. you still have to show up and be in some kind of mm -hmm. appearance. Yeah, that you mm -hmm. still got to have a lace front baby hair and lashes, even if you are mm -hmm. an intellectual or even if you have a voice. Yeah. Even if, that there's no more radio, that you still have to show up with yeah. a TV high, high HD face, you know? Yeah, it's true. So, Vanessa, I want to take you back to the 1930s. And I want to take you back to South Africa. And so for our U.S. audience, just think about what was happening in the 1930s, the Great Depression, the World War had just ended, the ski airmen, all this kind of stuff. This is all in the same time period. The last two or three conversations we've had from Harry Belafonte, remember Harry Belafonte was the mentee 
of um, Paul Robeson, and then maybe you remember we talked about um, uh, Peter Tosh was friends with Harry Belafonte, and then yesterday, who do we talk? Oh, we talked about um, Percy Sutton. He was in the Tuskegee Airmen. It's all kind of the same era, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, right? So the 1930s in South Africa, my God, it was um, a country in transition. It had, you know, if you've ever been to South Africa, you know it's comprised of many different beautiful tribes of people. And Marion was born um, to uh, a mother and father who didn't who didn't have much, but a lot of culture. And her mom actually um, was making local beer. Okay, when she was born, she was making local beer. Or and and Marion's um, life just lost my. I had to interrupt. Sorry, no Marty and his wife are just standing in front of me right now. No Hi, way. guys. I got to go. Sorry, it's such a weird world. Sorry, keep going. Keep going. We're going to talk about this at the end, y'all. Oh we God. take on the callers. It's oh, my weird. God. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we might be calling this in. We, we might be calling this in. We were just talking about this. <laughs> God was like toxic masculinity. Here's your ex-husband. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my goodness, baby, right? Okay, all right, y'all. This is how you can manifest okay. your contract. You can call in. You can walk towards That's what how you, you need. Manifest. You can walk away from what you need. It's powerful. Yes. Let's... Walk away, sis. Walk away. Walk away. Oh my God. So the mom. So the who? How do I even talk to you guys? The mom was making. Talk about tonic. She was making local beer, brewing local beer with you know hops and herbs and all those sorts of things. Kind of like the sister the other day was talking about. She was getting wine from South Africa. There's a whole tradition of wine, beer, cultivating different spirits. So um, spirits is an alcohol. Um, and her mom was one of these kind of brewers. Well, in the 19 um, or early 1900s, the then got transitioning government made a law that you can no longer make these cultural drinks, right? These beers, these wines, these tonics, you can no longer make them. And in fact, you had to, they tried to um, make it government sponsored where you have to go through the government and get like a seal. And then you had to, um, you had to get like the official seal in order to sell beer. And so they went through and rounded up all of these women who were making these brews, these traditional brews and, and imprison them. So as a, infant baby just days old Miriam McCabe was was imprisoned with her mother and her father didn't have enough money to get them out so her first I think she was there for like 18 months or something um she was there for a significant amount of time with her mommy in prison because her mom was making beer this is how her life started this is how her life started in prison so when she got out um yeah, when she got out, she was sent to live with her grandmother and her aunt, and she um, started singing, and she was a beautiful woman, and she was charismatic, and she just became super popular super quick for her voice, for her charisma, and by the time she turned 16 years old, Vanessa, so she was born in, in uh, 1932, by 1948, that is when apartheid officially started in South Africa. And if you don't know what apartheid is, think about Jim Crow. So in 1942 or 48, apartheid started where the minority government of white Afrikaners started putting the harshest, harshest laws in place in order to demoralize, oppress, and violently suppress the African people of South Africa. And this is everything from requiring that they have to carry passes to um, completely relocating and uprooting them from their homes to impri falsely imprisoning and making all of these extra judi judicial laws so that people had no freedom to um, taking away, taking kids out of their schools and putting them in um, basically um, like school um, uh, encampment schools. I mean, it was violent. It was violent. And so if you can imagine a 16-year-old charismatic girl who already has had run-ins um, with her family with the law, and this kind of oppression is starting to be legalized and she can feel it, she must have been enraged. She must have been enraged mm -hmm. at 16 to see her country changing. 
And so she kept singing Vanessa and she kept getting influence and she kept getting notoriety. She started singing with a guy's group and she started singing with a girl's group. And then it happened. There was this town um, called Sophia Town. And Sophia Town was built actually for white Afrikaners. So it was like beautifully built. It had like, you know, uh, you know, places you could have your parasol and walk down the street. It had parks, central parks and roundabouts and beautiful homes. But when, once they built the community, they realized that environmentally it was like, it was like, um, not, it was like an environmental hazard. There was like um, sewage runoff and all kinds of stuff where it wasn't properly built. And so the white people didn't want to live there. The wealthy white people didn't want to live there. So then the middle-class black people moved in there. And so it became this like a vibrant multicultural jewel of South Africa, Sophia town, where black middle-class, the white middle class who didn't want to move, the coloreds um, who are um, people of mixed ancestry, they call, them, they call themselves colored, uh, even to this day in South Africa and to the Asian and Indian communities. It was like this beautiful mixture. And you would imagine this is the 50s, right? And this is the 40s, 50s, 60s. So jazz is like really popping. So South African jazz is off the chain. Like there's all these artists. It's like its own Harlem Renaissance there. So you imagine Harlem in South Africa, that's Sophia Town. She's singing. She got gigs. I mean, she with the girls group. She got her little dresses. I mean, she's looking good, Mary McKeba. And then she got a gig, Vanessa, to... Um, travel and sing. And when she was away, one of the most horrific things in apartheid history happened. The entire town of Sophiaville was forcibly removed from their homes and put into a, a workers encampment. And like the whole town was demolished. And it was intentional because it was such a vibrant cultural center. That would be like everybody forcibly being removed from the Harlem Renaissance at the height of the Renaissance. And she was so angry. She was so angry. People were um, injured, people were killed, and they were all forcibly removed and all of their, their, their things taken away from them. And so this is when the revolution started in South Africa, really concertedly started, like they cannot do this to us. And so Marion McCaba wrote a song about it and she had been singing protest songs her whole, her whole time because she got something to say, but she said it in her beautiful soft voice. So, you know, people was confused. They got confused by her, but she had something to say. So she made this song, this, the Goodbye Sophia Town song. And this was the beginning. She became the voice of resistance in South Africa. Vanessa, when she, before she was the age of 20, she got married and divorced from an abusive husband. She had a baby and she survived breast cancer all before 20 years old. Wow. So then her beloved Sophia Town, yes, her beloved Sophia Town was raised and she wrote this beautiful song and she was performing it. And she, every single time she um, saying she spoke about what was happening in her country. Well, when she went on tour, her country refused to let her come back because she had been said such I do a remember vocal. Now. Yeah. Yes, the Afrikaner government refused to let her come back. There were some other things that happened where there was a movie called Come Back Africa, ironically. This white man made this movie that was the first real motion picture that was detailing the atrocities in South Africa. And you know what role she played in it? She played a woman who sang at a speakeasy with illegal alcohol. And she played it so good because it was a dedication to her mother. And then there was a, a movie that came out that was a very popular movie in South Africa, like in the 40s and 50s, that you think about that's like Rocky Balboa, and it was called King Kong. And it detailed the real life of a, um, of a boxer in South Africa who was very popular. And he was on the circuit and his life got turned upside down by apartheid. And he got, he got set to work forcibly at a camp and he ultimately committed suicide. And she was in that movie too. She was a star of that movie. And in fact, she met her husband, Hugh Masekela, her second husband, <laughs> Hugh Masekela, 
um, who she was married to, many of you might know, the famous Hugh Masekela. And so she was in these movies. She was then um, forcibly exiled from, from the Afrikaner white government. There was a huge fight going on between the Afrikaner government and the, um, and the ANC, the African National um, was a conference with uh, Nelson Mandela, and there are two or three other major factions that were fighting in, in apartheid. And the whole time, she could not even get back. And in fact, her mother passed away in the time when she was in exile, and they wouldn't let her come to the funeral. She was too powerful. And if you heard her voice, you would just be like, this small, small woman? How is she terrifying the Africana government? Well, the, re the rest of the world understood. And Vanessa, guess who came to her rescue? The one, the only, Harry Belafonte. <laughs> Harry Belafonte <laughs> knew Mama Africa like all of the cool people did who were in the Harlem Renaissance, who were in the 40s, 50s, 60s. She was on the scene. She was gorgeous. She was, um, you know, just, just singing protest song. And Harry Belafonte said, sister, come with me. They made an album together and she started touring the U.S. Well, that made her more powerful. She went on a, a night, um, a nightly show where there were 60 million viewers and she sang Pata Pata, which we'll sing, we'll play at the end, which is her most famous song. And she mesmerized the audiences. They were like, who is this? Who is she? How can I be like that? Why is she so beautiful? Why can't I stare? Why can't I look away? And what is she singing about? And she's fierce. She wouldn't make, she would not break eye contact on the cameras. She was just moving the crowd. She was, I mean, in the most feminine way, like this kind of internal power where she will not break con eye contact. She is nurturing them into caring and loving her people. And it was so beautiful. And so, um, during this time, something else happened. So there was another township that um, was, uh, God, what is the name of this township? I feel so bad. It's like quintessential history. Hold on one second. Um, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> is it, no, it's, oh God, what is the name? There's another township. Vanessa, we went to the township. I cannot remember, but when we were in South Africa, we went to this township. Oh. It was a township where um, the statue of the, of the, of the um, brothers carrying their um, sibling down the street. Oh. There was, um, a, I'll, I'll think of it in a second. When we open up the lines, I'll find it. But there was a violent clash between protesters and the Afrikaner police. Are you talking about Soweto? And they gunned down. No, not no. Soweto. It was before so Soweto. And okay, they gunned yeah. down. Yeah, no, no, no. It was, I'll think of it in a second. Um, and they gunned down 60. Oh, I'm getting a text. I'm getting a text. I hope somebody's over me. <laughs> I hope somebody's over me. So, Pretoria? I love you guys so much. No, not Pretoria. <laughs> not Pretoria. Okay. It's a good guess. It's nice. a good guess. I'll think of it in a second. Yeah. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. Um, and 69 people were killed, including two members of her family in the protest. Um, you've probably seen it. It's where people were doing the toy toy dance and they were like, it was a confrontation between the police and the South, Af South African, um, South African um, protesters. And 69 people were killed that day. And it, be it was the beginning of the actual revolution. They were like, we're not going out like this no more. We're not carrying passbooks. They started burning passbooks and she couldn't get into her country. So she went, um, she had to go to, um, she, all of the African countries gave her like diplomatic passports, um, but she chose to go to Guinea and um, she lived there for a de over a decade. And when she was there, Vanessa, she met another husband. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> let's see hard, y'all. You need somebody. Lisa, you need somebody to help me hunt up on. You really do. Lisa, you need you need somebody to play that role sometimes. Was none other than the one and only Stokely Carmichael. Oh, Stokely Carmichael. Oh yes, I did know. know this. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Stokely, okay. they had some cute wedding pictures. Stokely yep. Carmichael was in the Black the Black Panther movement. He it was functionally exiled um, from his own government, and they were both in Guinea together, and they fell 
fall in love, madly in love. They look so beautiful together. And they got married. And he was um, Sophie Carmichael, who, who changed his name to Kwame Touré. They were hosted by Sekou Touré, who was the um, president of Guinea. Um, and Sekou Touré wanted to marry her after she broke up with Sophie Carmichael. But she was like, nah, dude. <laughs> she was like, I'm not interested. But, um, but Sophie Carmichael... Um, uh, was the man who coined the, the, the phrase and term black power. And so, mm-hmm. of course, they thought she was way more radical after she married him. Um, mm-hmm. And so, but she kept, I mean, she got worldwide, worldwide fame by this time because she was touring through America. She was talk, She was really the voice of what was happening on the ground in South Africa. She became the voice of it. In fact, she got invited to speak to the general counsel at the UN. I want to play that little clip of what, of what she said to them. But the political situation in my country is tense and is even growing more tense. This, therefore, does not leave us with any option but to ask the United Nations to take positive action against the South African government. By positive action, I mean, of course, that the United Nations should put into action the very good resolutions calling for a complete boycott on South Africa and especially the sending of arms by outside powers to South Africa. I have not the slightest doubt that these arms will be used against the African women and children. So she was speaking truth to power in the most vulnerable way. And knowing that she had been exiled, and then she, when she married Stokely Carmichael, she could not go back to America because he was exiled there too. And so she was double exiled from her own country and from the country that made her famous in America. Um, it, the, the city is Sharpville. Um, and we, we went there right on the corner of Sharpville. Vanessa, I don't know if you were with me, actually. We were right on the corner. I was with Chelsea and the kids were coming out of school. And I was like, whoa, this is so powerful that we're on this corner. Because I had seen it so many times where there was like this um, this shootout between the Afrikaner police and these children. Uh, Ten children were killed in that massacre and 69, were, were, uh, 69 in total were killed. And so she started touring the world telling them the massacre that was happening in, 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 in South African apartheid. So um, eventually she, after five years, she and Stokely Carmichael um, uh, got a divorce. They were no longer married and she married a pilot um, and she started right. She wrote a book um, and she started making these beautiful protest songs and albums and started um, working toward like artist rights and all sorts of things, um, including like um, working with Paul Simon, coming out of retirement to work with Paul Simon. They had like a, a gazillion dollar hit. Uh, album together as you can imagine um and uh working uh and being friends with Hugh Masekela for the rest of her life um because I think that was probably her true love um and so I just was so floored by Mama Africa and I was like you don't have to be hard to be powerful and in fact you have to be extremely flexible in order to be extremely strong And I was so moved by her, and I encourage you all to go and watch her perform live, and you will see what I mean. She has this beautiful balance between strength and flexibility. Her, the fierceness of her stance and her heart posture and her eye contact with the gentleness of her voice and the vibrato in her voice and the sway of her hips is a masterclass for us in how to be black women and freedom fighters. And so I wanted to share her story with you today because I, I didn't know that much about her. And I was I like, whoa, know. Mama Africa, you did so much. <laughs> you did so much. I knew she was like up in Ghana with my Angela and Malcolm X and man, but I was just like, who is this woman who we look and fly all the time? <laughs> um, but now we know it's Miriam Makeba. So I want to open the lines and I want to ask you what you were taught about femininity. And I also want, if there's anybody who feels like they have been able to strike that balance, if you have tips for us on how to strike that balance, I would love any tips that you have for us on how to strike the balance between being a freedom fighter 
and being divinely feminine um, and, and having to fight for your life sometimes daily and sometimes alone without the support of any masculine energy in your life. How have you struck that balance? Um, if you have any words of advice, particularly our elders on the phone, if you have any words of advice, I know uh, speaking on behalf of Vanessa and me, we would be grateful. And any final words or thoughts from you, Lee? I'm thinking about Angela Davis for some reason, because when we had the literal like pleasure of our lives, honor of our lives to be able to interview Angela Davis with Nikki Giovanni, we were on a Zoom. And I'm thinking about the after the Zoom hung up and she was getting ready to go on a hike with her daughter. And I was just like, Angela Davis was so fresh. She was so feminine. She was she so did. like, and talk about like she divine did. feminine, like she was so in it. And I don't know how she's like in her seventies, that I am just like, to me, she's also a really perfect living, breathing example of somebody who has leaned into that power and found and has like a strong posture, a strong voice, a strong everything. And she's done it in this way that I just deeply admire. I do too. I do too. It's one of the things I loved about Mary McCabe is that her fashion sense was just, I mean, you would never know she was broken and that her heart was, she wasn't broken, but that her heart was broken for her country and that she was exiled because she just always showed up in this way that felt like she was constantly every day birthing herself and creating a new reality for herself in this way that I just deeply admire. She didn't come halfway, never. You know what I mean? She was just like, this is who I am, and this yeah. I'm going to birth a new reality for myself. Yeah, no, um, Professor Angela Davis came, has some little tights on. She had her little hiking boots. She got her, she's like, okay, ladies, I'm going to go for a hike. And we was like, okay, Angela Davis. <laughs> it was amazing. It was the honor of a lifetime. I think um, Nikki Giovanni has that in a different kind of way. She There's does. something about her gaze and how Ooh, she her holds, thug life like, had she to. holds to be wearing like her like yes. um, like ties all the time and yet also she does have that like the ampleness a suppleness a like just a, a a glow from the inside that is and her her poems are like that to me they are so like in the type of language that she used it always like kind of drips off your tongue in this way that I see as a good example of that she it's exactly right she has a sway to her rhythm and she has a spaciousness to her rhythm and all of these things is what I want for us. It's like, I don't want rigidity and tightness and hardness and cut and cutting. I don't want that for us anymore. So yeah, those women have found the way. And I have appreciated this story. We, we have do. Yeah, we do. We do. I'm okay. Not taking any callers. Um, yeah. I am grateful. I am grateful for this call. I am grateful for the opportunity to tell her story. If you have thoughts and you want to come on tomorrow and you sleep on it, you'd be like, I got the answer in the equation. Come on tomorrow and tell us. No, we um, won't be here tomorrow. We welcome that. We won't be here tomorrow because oh, it's Friday, y'all. Yes, exactly. So I just want to congratulate every single woman who walked with us all um, of the five days. If you did, you completed a warrior week. Uh, congratulations for showing up for yourself. We link to all the episodes that you missed in today's email. We also put a link to the uh, form that Morgan promised where you can actually put your black business in. So everything is in your inbox. So you can catch up this weekend on any episode you missed, especially if a conversation moved you, you can easily forward it to a friend and you can invite folks to catch up on stuff and or and they don't got to catch up if they don't want to and then meet us back here on Monday at noon live um, Eastern time at noon Eastern time. Yay. Happy weekend, everybody.